this is our special Zoom in June meeting. So welcome everyone and we've got two special presentations um, and the first one um, I'll introduce Amanda to um, introduce the talk, the presentation. So over to you Amanda. Okay. Hi everybody. Um, I'm to give you a bit of background, a bit of background to Keith's talk and how this all came about. So this year's April Working Bee was my fourth Working Bee trip to Tasman Island. It was the first Working Bee to include dedicated field naturalists amongst the volunteers. And this came about because um, from 2015 to this year's, I've always been a photographer documenting works, and but also interested in the scenery, the flora and the fauna, and trying to capture this to showcase what we do and where we do it on this fantastic island. Um, quickly, we realized that no one knew very much at all about the insect life in particular, and I began to set that as a goal for myself. We knew the birds and the plants pretty well, and we knew about the endemic um, Tasman Island cricket, Tasmana plectrum, plectron, sorry, isolatum, and that there was also an endemic Tasman Island snail, um, which we did find this trip and hadn't been seen probably since, I'm, I'm not sure if it was even seen in the 2005 um, trip. There was always mention of the Hamish Saunders report that was done in 2005 which was a dedicated survey involving five scientists and five days and they did use traps, um, pitfall traps and um, sweep nets and things to capture samples of spiders and insects which they then took to a repository at TMAG where it all still is and I'm not sure how much of it has even been gone through at this stage, but it's still there and most of it is unidentified. Um, except for ba to basic family and perhaps a few species, but often not even to species level. Um, that's always been our fallback to see what was on the island. And um, since then, lots happened. Um, lots has happened with the automation, as um, Carol mentioned, in 1976 and the, the leaving of the lighthouse keepers in 77. Um, the cattle, the sheep that used to graze the island were gone. Um, the trees had been cut down yep. for firewood. Yep. And, due today. and the, um, the cats that were kept as pets had become wild and feral or Apparently, they, I don't know whether they escaped or what happened, but there were feral cats on the island that multiplied. Um, so they decimated the bird population and probably the skink population as well. Um, plants, there was a trip over 77 and 78 to identify the plants. And Mick Brown, who's one of our field naturalists, um, was one of the identifiers, and identifiers of those. Uh, so that now, in 2021, instead of it looking like a moan top to the island, it's blossomed. <laughs> and we've got really high bracken and grasses and the cheesewood trees have grown enormously. Um, the banksias are just getting older and older. And um, as we all know, the task is to keep the grass down around the houses and on the tracks. It's hard to know exactly what this did for the wildlife, but the obvious winners were the birds and the skinks. And with the regrowth in vegetation, presumably the invertebrates have probably exponentially increased. And we began thinking we needed to know more and that another Hamish Saunders like BioBlitz was needed um, so well, soon in the near future. So this will in, involve lots of um, advance notice and possibly a summer trip to the island to make use of the warm weather when everything's up and out. Being a field naturalist, a single field naturalist had its problems, which I was sort of doing um, and which we had on other um, trips where I wasn't there, including safety and not straying too far from anyone else so that we didn't fall down sink sinkholes or off the cliffs and two sets of eyes and a different perspective are also a valuable asset. 
Carol has been really encouraging and supportive and could see the merits in developing this as the world becomes more aware of biodiversity and special environments, which Tasman Island is. I was delighted when Dr. Keith Martin-Smith, who I knew as a science teacher at Hutchins, was able to come. Keith is a scientist with a research background in marine and estuarine ecology, population ecology and marine ecology. Um, he's worked on seahorses in Sydney, in Tasmania. Um, he's working still as a science teacher at Hutchins, where he inspires lots of students and is doing more seahorse projects, I think, as citizen science projects. He's participated in lots of bio blitzes. And last year, he discovered and described a new species of chochus, or jumping spider. Um, Claire, uh, Keith is married to Dr. Claire Hawkins, who you might all know as the Where Where Wedgie project um, instigator with the Bookend Trust. And uh, this dynamic duo have lived, researched, and traveled in lots of interesting places. Keith's varied background experiences, knowledge and photographic expertise in capturing small critters was invaluable on this trip. The apparatus he brought with him, particularly the beating sheet, enabled us to find a myriad of invertebrates which we would otherwise not have seen. His contribution has been invaluable. He's obviously passionate about invertebrates, spiders, wasps, um, orchids, which we didn't see, but we were at the wrong time of the year. Um, plus, he's demonstrated the value of using iNaturalists to record our observations, so they're out there as an ongoing databases, data basis, base, sorry, for FOTI. I'd like to welcome Dr. Keith Martin-Smith. Thank, thanks, Amanda. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen in a second. If um, you've got some questions as you're going along, perhaps if you could just put them in the chat, um, and Amanda might be able to answer them, or I can answer them. Um, not uh, not go on too long, and um, I've uh, I've Amanda has given me some feedback about not being too overly scientific about my um, <laughs> about what I'm talking about. So um, so here this is um, sort of our report on um, the survey that we did in uh, in early April, and for some reason, oh, there we go. Um, so please forgive me, um, my first trip to Tasman Island, um, I'm working off what I found as published knowledge. I'm sure uh, I got some of it wrong, so please correct me if, uh, if anything that I've put down is, um, is incorrect. But um, so I put this talk together for the field gnats, um, and basically, so I've given them a bit of background. Hopefully, um, the people here are much more um, clued up about Tasman than the general field gnats. But um, these were just some of the some of the sort of uh, background bits of information that uh, that I felt were was important, and I actually found that picture of. Uh, Tasman in uh, 19 in 1986, I think it is 1987, um, showing the uh, pasture rather than the vegetation that there is now. So here's um, photo from our, our trip, just showing some of the uh, the habitats that we are surveying. So just gone through a couple of the so we've got the grassland and low heath vegetation, um, obviously. There's the, the cliffs from the landing. Um, we've got lots of the sedge land. Um, and then we can see over here on the left-hand side the regenerating scrub, um, which uh, has there's various varieties of it um, around the island. So as Amanda mentioned, what we had beforehand was um, the knowledge we had was most of it, particularly for um, invertebrates. Um, oh, uh, thanks, Ian. Sorry. <laughs> um, the 
There was an extensive survey done in 2005 in November, so in, um, in late, late spring, um, five days of surveys um, by six scientists, and they did a variety of different trapping methods. Um, they didn't have particularly good weather um, for, their, for their work. Um, and then since then, Amanda has been adding to our knowledge. Um, and there's a little map from the Hamish Saunders, uh, Hamish Saunders trip about the different vegetation communities. So that's where they, and the, you can see the samples that they took the vegetation quadrats and um, various, various other things that they found. Um, so we can see down here in the left hand, um, bottom left hand bit of the vegetation where the, um, where the extent of the uh, Tasman Island she oak, uh, sorry, Tasman Peninsula she oak forest is, which is um, basically the southwest of the plateau of the island. Um, and there we go. So, so in 2005, they recorded um, these invertebrates. They had 22 orders. So order is the scientific classification for things um, Things like uh, bees, bees and wasps would be an order of invertebrates, um, and um, so so they found 22 different orders. Um, they they've only they collected quite a lot of material, and as Amanda said, a lot of that's still apparently sitting in the museum and hasn't been sorted through. And that's perhaps um, one of the things that um, I've been talking with Simon Grove about. Um, uh, perhaps, perhaps starting, starting to look at some of the groups that I'm interested in, um, and we can sort of we could start to to build up a proper species list. The snails were done very well in 2005, and there was a new species which was it was found it was discovered and hasn't been I don't think it's got a some proper name yet, but um, that was first found in 2005 as well as this endemic um, cave cricket. Um, oops, there we go. So this is the map of where Amanda and I sampled. And you can see we tried to cover as much um, as possible of the island. Um, so you can see we basically uh, we surveyed around the lighthouse keeper's quarters. We went to the uh, forested areas of the different kinds. We went through, we went through the scrub um, and we went to the, the haulage, um, at the top of the, uh, the top of the haulage there. Um, so the methods, we did some direct observation where we were just sort of looking for things. We had the beating sheet, which I'll show you a picture in a minute. It's basically, it's a white sheet you hold under vegetation and then you bash the vegetation with a stick and all the in invertebrates basically fall off onto the sheet and you can see them because it's white. Sweep net is basically just a big butterfly net that you sweep through the grass or other low vegetation. And then there is a thing called a malaise trap. I'll also show you a picture of that, which flying insects, they fly into it, they bash into it, and then they get funneled by various baffles into a collecting pot. Um, and I did have one night of pitfall traps, which are little plastic cups that you dig into the ground and things that are walking around fall into them and then you can sort of find them the next morning. The permits that Amanda and I had was only for photographs, so we didn't collect any um, and certainly any future um, work, I'd suggest that we, uh, we get a, a sort of a generalized collecting permit, um, which we should be able to do fairly easily. Um, so, so there's, there's my beating sheet. sheet. Um, so, so we've, we've just done a beat, and I'm busy uh, reviewing some of the photographs of the things that have fallen onto the beating sheet. And here's me setting up the uh, the malaise trap, the slam trap. The insects flying along, they hit the black mesh. They then 
they then hit the black mesh and then they tend to fly upwards. That's their, their, the way that they, they go. And then they get funneled by the white into, and I haven't put the, um, the collecting pot on the top in this photo because I'm just pinning out the, um, the little trap at, the, at that time. Um, to give you an idea of size, and this is something I hadn't done before, these are, so on the left is my beating sheet, and you can see that's, um, that's one centimetre between two and three there, and the same thing on the right between one and two, and each of those little divisions is half a millimetre. So when you see the photographs of these things sitting on the beating sheet, um, that each of the fibres on the beating sheet is approximately... Uh, 0.28 of a millimeter in the left and 25 millimeters on the right. So you'll see that some of the things that we were looking at were really small, were one or two millimeters long. So that's just to um, give you a sense of proportion because when you blow them up, they can look quite um, interesting and scary, but they're in fact absolutely tiny. Um, the I set up a Friends of Tasman Island uh, grew, uh, a project on iNaturalist. So iNaturalist is a citizen science platform where you can upload your observations. Um, and basically, all of our observations from this trip, Amanda and I have put up there. And um, anyone can go and sign up to iNaturalist. You don't even need to sign up to iNaturalist, actually, to see the records. Um, you, uh, you, just, you can do that. Um, even a, a, as, a, as a guest. Um, we identified the organisms as best we could using a variety of resources, particularly the Insects of Tasmania website that Christy Ellingson and Tony Daly run, and the Spiders of Tasmania um, website and book that John Douglas um, has done. And then once you put them up on iNaturalist, what, what's a really good thing about that is that you get a... Um, you get experts coming in and um, being able to confirm or modify your identifications. So, and I'll give you an example of that later on. So, this is summary of what we found. So, um, so I've put them into various groups. Um, we've got the the vertebrates, the things that Amanda and I. I mean, we're interested in them, but wasn't the main focus. So that's, how, that's all the big things that everybody else sees, the birds, the lizards, the seals. Um, but then all the other smaller stuff that most people aren't seeing are down in the invertebrates. So our slugs and snails, our land hoppers and slaters, our centipedes, etc. So you can see that we found around about 400 species during our nine days of sampling. Um, representing 110 families. So a family is a, a higher order of classification. So um, a number of those would be, might be duplicates at this stage, but um, I'm thinking that we, found, we would have found at least 300 different species um, during our time there, which I think um, is pretty good for, um, for a fairly short period of time. So, on to some of the more interesting stuff where you actually see these things. So, um, so all the dry sciencey stuff now is is done, and I'll show you some of these um, some of these uh, things that we found and um, a few little quirky facts about them. So, here on the we've got there are a couple of slugs. The um, the milky slug down the bottom is an introduced species that would have come in when the pasture with either the pasture when it was being established or perhaps with, um, with feed or with the animals that when they were brought onto the island. Um, the hedgehog slug is a native and then the one that's really interesting on the right is this is the endemic Tasman Island snail. Um, because it's on a bit of wood you can't actually see how tiny that is but it is about two millimeters across so it's a tiny tiny little snail um, Amanda found five of these she was picking up bits of wood she turned over um, a little bit of she oak and there were five or six of these little snails clustered underneath um, a real thrill to see something that's only known from Tasman Island here are our land hoppers and slaters there are probably a lot more of these 
um, but they, uh, the, the techniques we used weren't particularly good for, for finding these. So um, you can see that the, so the, the little land hopper up on the top right, that was in a pitfall trap. The, the other, other two, two were roaming, roaming around on, on the lighthouse. lighthouse. One, One of our big things, things Amanda and I's morning, morning routine, was getting, was getting up um, as soon as it was light, light and then wandering around the base of the lighthouse, lighthouse which acts as a fantastic, fantastic um, collecting station. station. So, so the, the invertebrates really love um, being, being, being there in, in the morning and all of the things that eat the invertebrates, the the, the spiders and so on, they all come out to feast on whatever's sort of turned up overnight. So, so we found a lot of things just on the lighthouse. Um, these are our uh, myriapods. So these are the centipedes, millipedes. And the thing on the left is a thing called a symphylon, which is kind of related but, uh, but a bit different. They are interesting in the fact that they... Um, they start off with six pairs of legs, and then as they molt, as they grow, they, they add an, a section and a pair of legs each time they molt until they get up to 12 pairs of legs, um, and that's when they're adult. So this one that we can see here, I think when I counted up, two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven, so it hasn't quite reached maturity. It's got one more pair of legs to develop. Um, the, uh, those are both, that's a native millipede. Um, millipedes are very difficult to identify from photographs, um, so just leaving it at that um, higher level of classification. Um, here are some of our other miscellaneous invertebrates. We've got um, some springtails of the three different uh, groups of springtails in the middle at the top. These little globular springtails, which are gorgeous little um, they almost look like uh, painting by numbers. Um, somebody's blobbed them in, and they have funny, funny sort of ocelli, the eyes up the top. They've got a bunch of those on each side. At the bottom right, we've got the uh, another group of springtails, sort of flattened, hairy springtails. And then bottom left, we've got the little, um, little uh, springtails, which are. Um, they're, they're called jelly springtails. Spring they look like little little bits of jelly. And you can see, again, those ones are very tiny. Um, they're probably feeding on the fungus that's growing on that bit of dead wood. A couple of brown lacewings, um, which uh, the Tasmanian brown lacewing up the top right, and then um, a one that doesn't have, really have a common name at the middle at the bottom. And then a lot of... Uh, little forest cockroaches that uh, were pretty common in the beating and the, um, and the uh, sweep nets. And you can see, uh, looking at the size, so that globular springtail, the little uh, rastriopes up the top middle, um, remember each of those fibers is a quarter of a millimeter. So that's about two millimeters long, that little springtail there. Um, crickets, we found a variety of crickets, uh, the, there's that conehead grasshopper, the top right, um, lots of field crickets which are very common throughout Tasmania, the bottom right, and then one, one example of a juvenile raspy cricket which, um, the bottom left with the incredibly long antennae. Um, we didn't find, we had a bit of a look down at, uh, the, uh, Quarters one for the uh, endemic Tasman Island cricket, uh, but we didn't have any luck with finding that one. It's um, it has been seen in in drain when it was found on the Hamish Saunders trip. It was found in drains at Q2, um, but we didn't we didn't have any luck with that one. Um, one damselfly. It's a bit late for dragonflies and damselflies. Um, getting a bit late in the year for them. Um, okay, so on to the, the, the major groups of the invertebrates. Um, lots of flies of different kinds, um, particularly in the sweep nets and through the, through the uh, sedgy vegetation. So the chironomids there, the, they're the midges, muskids are the normal flies, and then sierrids don't really have a, have a common name. So quite a lot of those. Here's a little black scavenger fly. Um, 
lovely, lovely little shiny, shiny body. body. Um, um, lots, lots of soldier flies when we first, first arrived on the island, island and everyone was, would have said, said um, in, in the, the houses, basically, basically all the windows were just, just covered in soldier flies for the first few days of our trip. Um, and then they all seem to sort of disappear. And this is a female wingless soldier fly, which is, um, is actually laying its eggs in some broken bit of the surface of the lighthouse. So not quite sure whether they developed properly there, but um, she was having a go anyway. Um, these are some of my favorite little flies. They're called dance flies, and they're quite active predators. And this one's grabbed um, another fly and is having a good chow down on, on that. Um, so they're about, prob they're a bit bigger, might be um, in the order of uh, eight or nine millimeters, so getting up towards a centimeter long. Beetles were also abundant, particularly in the beating trays, and some of them were highly abundant, like this little Banksia beetle. So every time we, we beat a Banksia, we'd get dozens of these little um, golden beetles falling into our, into our sweet net. So they're, they're, and they're specialists on the Banksias, so we'd only find them on the Banksias. Um, a couple of interesting records, um, which... Uh, these things which don't really have um, common names, I'm afraid. So I've just put up the scientific names, but I'll show you a couple of photos of these. So this one is a big uh, rove beetle, um, and this one was probably about two centimeters long, Amanda, something like that. Yep, so. Um, and very big jaws, very colorful. Amanda and I were, we thought we'd missed it. It fell down into the bushes, sort of climbed back up again. We were, we were um, desperate to get a photograph of it because um, it was so, we didn't even know what it was when we were, we were seeing it first up. Um, this one was on the lighthouse. Um, got these really interesting feathery, feathery antennae. Um, nearest records of this beetle is from the Warra in southern Tasmania, so it's quite a long way from home. Um, just just really interesting beetle. I was struggling to work out what it was for quite a while, I actually had to email Christy Ellingson to, um, to sort of get a, a handle on that one. And another group that were pretty abundant were the, the true bugs. These are, they look like beetles, but they have a sucking mouth part. Um, so, so here's some of the more interesting ones. These little plant hopper nymphs um, down the bottom left, they've got these, uh, these gorgeous um, camouflaged bodies when they are juveniles like this. Um, they really fit in well with the things that they're living on and they've got horns and protrusions all over them which are basically protection from predators. Um, this shows the value of iNaturalist. So this was a, a, a thing called a lace bug that I photographed, and I put it up on iNaturalist, and Ryan Schoffner, who is um, who's a sort of world expert on these things, I, I know him from a, a previous expedition that I did, and he's come up and he's gone, oh, I recognize it, I can see it. Um, it, it looks, looks similar, similar to something, to but he doesn't know of a described lace bug in this uh, that looks like this. So potentially this might be an undescribed species um, from Tasman Island. And um, that's the kind of thing that, um, that would be really good uh, to pursue further. So, so if we, f we went again, we would collect this and we would send it off to Ryan and he would... Um, have a look at it and see if it was indeed a new species. Moths. Um, Amanda thought the moths were going to be really abundant um, because of the time of year. Um, but we were actually a little disappointed in the number of moths that we found. Um, we thought there would be more. There was only one butterfly that we saw. It's a bit late in the season for butterflies. Um, some of these beautifully colored moths um, so we've got the black and white tiger moth here and lots and lots of these lovely little spotted heliotrope moths that, um, down the bottom left. 
My one of my favourite groups is the Bees and the Wasps, and um, these were the most abundant that things that we found in terms of number of species. So probably more than a hundred species of bees and wasps that we found. And of course, when you say wasps to most people, they just think of leather jack of yellow jackets, the introduced European wasps. But most wasps um, that we get in Tasmania are tiny, tiny little things that are really useful. They are uh, parasites or parasitoids. They control potentially uh, damaging insects that, um, and they just, some of them have really interesting life cycles where they lay their eggs into developing caterpillars and so on. Um, this large cream spotted Newman was really common throughout, um, big flying thing and these ones are about uh, three or four centimeters long. So Amanda and I saw quite a few of those um, over the time we were there. This is a family of wasps that uh, have a shelf on their face, and you can see they're all small. So they're all um, in the order of sort of uh, less than a centimetre. Um, these are all different species of these. None of them have common names, but um, I'm just illustrating the diversity of uh, some of the things that we found. Um, these are parasitoids. So they, are, they lay their eggs into the eggs or the larvae of flies, so they control populations of flies mostly. Um, this, the one on the left, the little fairy fly, we only found from the, uh, the, Mala the slam traps, the malaise traps, and they are really tiny. Um, and they are very seldom collected, even though they're probably quite abundant, because they are so tiny and so fragile. The wasp on the right is actually a fig wasp, but that's a bit of a misnomer in this case. The fig wasp is the family, but these ones in Tasmania don't live in figs. So even though they're in the fig wasp family, they actually don't have anything to do with figs. And they actually um, are parasitoids of ants. So you'll, that, that big spine on the back of the wasp is to protect them when they go into ants' nests from basically being attacked from behind by the ants. Um, these are ones that a lot of people are quite familiar with because they generally are a little bit bigger um, and you often see them flying around. These are the um, Braconids and the Ichneumans. Um, they are a big, big, those two families are very, very uh, diverse. And these are all females. You can see I've, they're all females with a variety of lengths of that thing that looks like a sting. It's not a sting, it's their egg laying device, their ovipositor. So basically you can tell the kinds of things that they're laying their eggs in from the size of the ovipositor. So the longer the ovipositor, the, um, the deeper into, a, into vegetation or wood holes the wasp has to get to in order to lay its eggs. So the ones with really long ovipositors generally are after beetles that are beetle grubs that are boring into, um, deep into wood. Um, whereas the ones with smaller ovipositors are often um, after caterpillars or things that are on the surface. So we've got a variety. So we've got one that's on the lighthouse, the top right, one on vegetation, um, one on some wood, and then one from the beating sheet. This is a variety of um, little tiny, tiny wasps that are often very colorful, um, have metallic bodies. Um, they've, got, uh, they've got a variety of different life cycles. The one center top, the Petiolarchus, beautiful tiny tiny wasp i've never seen anything like it before it's got these uh, this sort of blue head and it's got a, a shiny body and then a couple of um, little white tips to its antennae and remember those little grids on the uh, quarter of a millimeter on that um, sweep net so that wasp is about just over a millimeter long but beautifully patterned and colored um, these are these, when you, when you look at them, um, very, it's actually much better to look at them through the photograph than it is 
um, in real life because you, you, you don't see all of those that beautiful detail. Um, another big group of wasps are the, this uh, super family. Top left we've got a wasp which is a spider parasite and then the other two are parasites of butterflies. So we've got a couple more different life cycles. The, um, the ones that are spider parasites often have reduced wings for running around in the vegetation. Lots of ants of different kinds, um, some from the lighthouse, some from under rocks, some from the beating sheet. We've got um, this very primitive uh, big uh, orange ant at the top left with some quite impressive jaws. Um, and then a rainbow ant in the middle and then a, what's called a spider ant down the bottom. Although that's a, again a bit of a misnomer for this particular group. And then Finally, in our sort of tour through the invertebrates are our arachnids. So these are the pseudoscorpions and spiders, mites, and true scorpions. So we found the one scorpion that's in Tasmania um, on Tasman Island, um, one pseudoscorpion, and we found lots and lots of different spiders, some of them quite difficult to identify. Um, this one here has got a very impressive set of jaws on it. The... Um, the, in this, this, uh, this group all have rather large jaws, but it, remember it is quite small. This was really interesting. I didn't get this at the time. Um, this is a, uh, a trapdoor spider, which is, was on the lighthouse. I can see we've got a couple of arachnophobes. I'm sorry about this. I will um, give you true warning when we get out of the spiders again. Um, these are a couple of um, spiders that um, Amanda, particularly the one on the left, Amanda was very excited to find, uh, as was I, to find this high-headed archies. And then the wraparound spiders are always um, really cute, wrapped around a casuarina needle. Um, a bunch of different crab spiders. Um, the uh, Stephanopus uh, at the top right um, very, it's a male with very hairy legs, which presumably have something to do with its courtship routine, but I um, haven't been able to find anything more about that. A um, few other families, wolf spiders, um, sack spiders and ground spiders, um, again some with some fairly impressive looking jaws. And then my favourites are these lovely little jumping spiders, which are really cute and really personable. They, they turn to look at you and they've got these gorgeous um, iridescent eyes, great big eyes, and they, they really have a great personality. Um, this one I consulted with a friend from, um, from, the universe, uh, from the Museum of Victoria and he thinks it's probably an undescribed species. It was quite common all over the island, and Amanda and I, yeah, they, they really are lovely little, little animals. A um, couple more jumping spiders. This one is in the peacock, fam peacock spider um, genus, but this, is the, this particular one has only recently been moved there, and it doesn't have the, the colorful fan that most of the peacock spiders have. Um, and then to finish up with the spiders, um, a couple of unidentified jumping spiders. The one on the right I've called Amanda's Stripy Jumper because Amanda um, has been photographing this one forever. Very common on the lighthouse. Um, there were six of them living in the little flashing um, where the, where the uh, electrical connections go up. Um, and, and they'd come out in the morning and we'd see them foraging and they do this thing with their palps where they're basically cleaning their eyes with their palps, yeah, like Amanda's miming at the moment. So, so arachnophobes, you may, have, you may, uh, we have no more spiders up on screen. You can, um, Elaine, there you go. Um, so just to finish up, I'd like to thank Foti for the fantastic opportunity to, to visit Tasman Island. Um, De Pipwi for, for and Elise for getting our permit 
and then of course the fantastic crew most of whom are on this zoom call as well who were just they were such a nice bunch of people to to be stuck on an island with we couldn't have wished for any better people